This is the Real Change Wilmington podcast, episode 39, from Laundromat Libraries to Literacy Foundation with our guests today, Karen Long and Elizabeth Huber. Again, all of this is about breaking down barriers to access to books. And it's about promoting book ownership and promoting the creation of little libraries in their own homes. It's important for kids all ages and adults to value owning books and having a book to be able to go to, to pick out, to read. What is going on, everyone? This is your host of the Real Change Wilmington podcast, Dustin Pierce, joined with my co-host. Tierra Harris. Real Change is a positive, constructive, and lighthearted source of local news events and resources. And on our podcast, we interview leaders of local organizations to help squash rumors and encourage a greater sense of pride in our community. Before we get started with our guests today, Tira, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Harvest Gold is going to end our after school program for this semester next week. So just getting everything prepared to end that. We're supposed to have a fun pizza party ice cream day that I promised the kids. So yeah, living up to that expectation, mm-hmm. you know, have that weight on my shoulders. And then we also have a golf outing coming up in May. So just preparing for all of that. What kind of pizza are you getting for this event? I actually made them vote. Okay. So they democracy. chose... Democracy. Yeah, <laughs> democracy at a young age. So <laughs> we like voted for flavor and for the place. The majority said pepperoni from Domino's. I might have to appease someone and get pineapple from a different place. We'll, okay. s- we'll see. Nice. Okay. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of boring, but that's my life. How's your life going? It's pretty good. So Wheelie's on Mulberry opened recently. Yeah. And I got a test drive an e-bike for the first time. So Were you there at the event that they had? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was there. And I liked it. So basically, it's like a pedal assist feature. So okay. It's not quite a motorcycle. It's just you pedal, and then when you get fatigued, it kicks in a little bit extra for you, which is great for going up hills and stuff, yeah. mountain biking, because I hate, 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 hate pedaling. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. no Tesla bikes yet? They don't come to you? <laughs> no, they're, they're not self-driving okay. bikes. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you enjoy most about our interview with Karen and Elizabeth? There was a lot of information, but I think I enjoyed hearing Karen speak about the bookmobile because I think that's really cool. Mm-hmm. I don't have any memories with a bookmobile, but just her wanting to, spoiler alert, bring this to <laughs> Clinton County at some point. I really enjoyed hearing about that. Yeah, I hope the bookmobile has like a cool song that it plays. Yes, it's like an ice cream truck. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, they have to do that for sure. <laughs> I think my favorite part of the interview was just hearing Karen talk about the importance of reading at a young age and just kind of the facts and statistics about that. It really kind of blew my mind. I don't really think of reading as that important, but... Now you do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So yeah, without further ado, let's jump into our podcast with Karen and Elizabeth. Karen and Elizabeth, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks for Appreciate having your us. time. Yeah. So we're going to first just learn about you guys and then about the Literary Foundation and Dolly Parton Library also, and then what you guys do in the community. So let's start with you. Karen, yes. tell us about how you got to Wilmington and about your background. Oh, how I got to Wilmington? I was looking for a teaching job. I wanted to move closer to home. My parents lived on the west side of Cincinnati at the time, and I wanted to move closer to them. I was in northeastern Ohio. And so I came here and I got a job at East End Elementary. And I taught there for several years, and then I was asked to come to the middle school, and I did. Uh, I went to the middle school and taught language arts, and then I became the principal at Denver Place Elementary and ended my career as the principal at Holmes Elementary. What year did you retire from that? Right before COVID. So it was the year perfect before timing. COVID. Yep, it was perfect timing <laughs> in hindsight, but it was that year before COVID. And I went to part-time work at Miami University recruiting for a master's program through the Ohio Writing Project that I had done my master's work and I was recruiting teachers into that program. And then my husband and I wanted to travel full-time, so I stopped doing that, and we did some full-time traveling. And now I'm back, and prior to that full-time traveling, I was working with Elizabeth, some on this volunteer work that we're gonna talk about today, and came home and did that some more, and that's what I'm busy doing now. What was an experience you had growing up that really shaped your love for reading? Oh. Without a doubt, it was the bookmobile. It was visiting the bookmobile in the summer. My mom would take us to the library all the time, a small 25th Street branch library in our hometown. But during the summer, I just loved going to the bookmobile, riding my bike down there. I knew which day it was gonna be there. I can't tell you that now, but I knew that then that which day it was gonna be there, what time it was gonna be there. And my sisters and I, we'd ride our bikes down and go into the bookmobile. I still remember my little orange card that had a metal little piece in it. 
and it went into this machine that somehow associated my books with this card. I don't know how it worked like magic, but I got to take these books home and read them and take them back to the bookmobile the next time it was there. And then for some time, the bookmobile would also come to our elementary school. We had a school library, but for some reason, I, I do remember going to the bookmobile from elementary school too. It would park beside the building and we'd get to go out during the week to the bookmobile. I just loved it. And that's my dream is to resurrect the bookmobile somehow in Clinton County and take books into the neighborhoods of kids because it was so meaningful to me and I just loved it. I could still smell it. What was your favorite book? <sighs> when I was little, I don't really remember. I know my parents read aloud to me some, but I don't remember it a lot, even though I talk so much about it now, reading aloud to kiddos. But a book that I remember, a uh, biography of Florence Nightingale, which was really meaningful and I loved that and did a lot of reading biographies then after that. But then another book that I really loved in middle school was Where the Red Fern Grows. I think a lot of times people associate that as a boy book, but I just loved the story of the dogs and the boy who was a coon hunter, even though that's not at all my background. But I think I loved it telling me about something that was totally outside myself. You know, I know that books are sometimes reflections of ourselves and maybe Florence Nightingale, I was never a nurse, but maybe I saw myself a little bit in Florence Nightingale of wanting to be kind and giving in her biography. But then Where the Red Fern Grows was such a different story of my own life. It was a window into the world of outside myself. And I think that's one of the things I really love about books. Different books offer both. And sometimes the same book can offer both of those things, a reflection of myself and a look out into the world. So these days, are you reading more like biography still? Or is it more like... I probably read more fiction. realistic fiction okay. than biographies. Right now I'm busy reading the Clinton County Reads book, Rough Sleepers. And it's more, it's not biography, but it's definitely, it's nonfiction about a doctor and his work in Boston with the homeless population in Boston over his career of like 50 years. It's really amazing. It's an amazing book. Yeah. So a real mix. So Elizabeth, I'll ask you a second question. How did you get to Wilmington? I was raised here. I went away to college and I came back here. When I came back here, I worked for 20 some years as a retail manager at the outlet mall doing retail. Unfortunately, the store that I worked for closed and then I got a temp job. And from the temp job, I was recruited to work at the News Journal and I have been there for almost 10 years now. I love it. I love the community aspect of it. I never would have imagined that I would have ended up back here, but I really do love this town and I love our community. So I'm happy to be back and raising my kids here. I've heard a lot of people say that they grew up here and didn't imagine themselves staying here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's just kind of like, it is what you make it a little bit too? Yes, it is what you make it 100%. If you don't like something, do something about it, change it. You know, you just gotta go out and do. So growing up, what sparked your interest and passion for reading? So I really didn't start reading until middle school. My mom always read to me when I was little, but I didn't really start reading on my own until middle school. And I had Mrs. McCoy and I, to this day, will forever miss her. She was the greatest influence as a teacher that I've ever had. She was a huge reader. She was a huge advocate for just choosing what you wanted to read and not making you read certain books and finding what you loved about it. And just seeing her passion has really brought a passion to me and that has continued. So what's your favorite book? I think my favorite book is from Kristen Hanna, The Nightingale. It's set back in war times and it's about this really strong woman who comes through the end and makes it. And it's just one that really makes you in your feels and well written and it just traps you. It's a huge book, but it just traps you. And so I really like it. I bet it's close to like seven or 800 pages. Oh it's goodness. a lot. Yeah, but it's worth it. Right now I am reading a story. My daughter is 13 and she loves to read as well. And so we are reading a series together right now. It's the Crave series. I've read it previously, but she wants to read it. And so we're reading it together so we can talk about it. What's that about? A girl who was 
orphaned and she goes to live with her uncle in Alaska at this castle and there's werewolves and vampires and dragons and when she gets there she has no clue that any of that is going on or happening and there's these brothers that fight and it's definitely a young adult book. It's by Tracy Wolf, the series is. And I read it a couple years ago and she loves it. So I want to be able to speak to her and talk to her about it. So let's transition into the Clinton County Literacy Foundation. Okay. So, Karen, tell us about how this got started. It started as laundromat libraries. I saw an NPR article about how they started laundromat libraries in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I was like, we can do that here. And reposted it on Facebook and said, hey, who thinks we could do this here? Who wants to do this with me? Could we do this in our county? And I got responses and we had a little meeting and from there went out and talked to laundromat owners. And at the time there were five laundromats in Clinton County and all but one said yes. The one in New Vienna was just so nervous about children coming into their laundromats and getting hurt that they didn't want us to put children's books in their laundromat to attract children. So we decided to put it in those the four that said yes, two in Wilmington, one in Blanchester, and one in Sabina. The New Vienna one isn't there anymore, but we understand that there's a new laundromat coming to New Vienna. It is officially open, so we are in the process of trying to find the owners to see if we can work out a partnership with them as well. Yeah. So what year was this when you started this laundromat? 2020. 2020. November of 2020 mm -hmm. is when we put our first laundromat libraries in. And that's mm -hmm. what we called ourselves. And that was like in the midst of COVID. Yes. It was. And it was also at the same time, the Dolly Parton Imagination Library was coming statewide. And so it made sense for us to put Dolly Parton Imagination flyers at our laundromat library locations because at that time we were targeting children's books in the laundromats. Something for kids to do while they waited for their parents to do the laundry instead of running around or not doing anything or being on phones, giving them books to look at while they waited. And teaching families that reading is a good thing to do while you wait and it's good to do for your children, read while you wait, wherever you are, the laundromat, the doctor's office, wherever. So we targeted laundromats and then put Dolly Parton Imagination Library flyers there. Clinton County was becoming a Dolly Parton Imagination Library site in March of that year. So they of had- 21? Of 20. 20, okay. So they had started in March of 2020. And so these flyers were available to us. We partnered with the library. At the time, it was a lot of families filling out paper flyers and paper enrollment pages for Dolly Parton Imagination Library. So we had the paper flyers and it directed families to return those to their local libraries. Now there's a lot of online enrollment into Dolly Parton. Going back to the Clinton County Literacy Foundation, we grew from laundromats. I left to do some full-time traveling and I left the laundromats in the care of Elizabeth Huber. And Elizabeth just grew our laundromat library program while I was gone. You wanna talk about that? So we started in 2020 with our four laundromat libraries. And then we were able to grow and we went to the homeless shelter mm -hmm. and put up a new library there. And then we started doing events. We did the Earth Day celebration that Main Street Wilmington put on, thanks to Timber Tech and other people donating. We did story time every hour or every 30 minutes, where we had different people from the community come in and read. Mrs. Harris came in from Harvest to Gold. We had a superintendent of the Wilmington schools there. We had preschool teachers. There were so many people that just reached out and said, hey, will you come read to kids? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. So that was kind of our first really big event. And then we started doing farmer's markets where they allowed us to set up as many as we could. We About did. once a month, probably. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then coming completely out of COVID, when everything really started picking back up in 2023, we were approached from Renee Walker at People's Bank downtown. And Renee said, hey, how would you guys like to get your 501c3? And I said, that sounds terrifying. It sounds very scary. <laughs> and she was like, we'll help fund you to do that. 
so we did some research and figured that we could do it and Karen, you know, applied for it. It was thanks to her generous donation and a donation from the Eagles in Wilmington and private donors that we were able to get our 501c3 status in 2023. So who's on your board as a nonprofit? So it's Karen and I as co-founders and president. Sarah Williams is our secretary and treasurer. Mrs. Harris is on our board. Amber Cheney from the Blanchester Library. Kirsten Harris, who's with the Kiwanis. Jamie Rowe is with the the Board of DD. And then we have Karen Carter. Yeah. Is a is one Barb Atley. There's a long list. Nick McCabe. We have, a lot. Mm-hmm. we have a lot of people who have just stepped up. Marcy Hills Camp, Nikki Quallen are people nice. who sit on our board. And you know, some people are more active than others, and some people, if we have an event, we you know we can count on them to be there. So we have an active group of volunteers. So you don't have like a director or staff, it's just a board currently? Just a board. No okay. director, no staff. This is all volunteer. Small nobody but takes, mighty. Yeah. Nobody takes home any money. Mm-mm. It's all volunteer. I also want to make sure we say that as I was leaving on my trip, I needed to get the books out of my garage because we would be gone. And the Wilmington News Journal, where Elizabeth works, really stepped up and said, you can have some shelf space here. And it was exactly what we needed because it was a public space, like Elizabeth said, for these champions from all the different laundromat libraries to be able to come, access books, fill up a box or two, and take them to their laundromat and restock the shelves. So we could not do what we're doing without the Wilmington News Journal or someplace like the News Journal who is just so gracious to us to provide us space for books. So when did you leave for your trip and how long were you going for? I left in October of 21 and got back a year later. So Elizabeth and all these volunteers really carried and grew. The program was bigger and I was watching it from our travels and I was posting things on Facebook still and helping with some communication things. I was involved remotely. But I knew when I got back that I wanted to be more involved in accessing families. I wanted to work with families to impress upon them the importance of reading to their children, birth to five, before they're involved in school or while they're in preschool settings. So I really wanted to get involved in a bigger way besides just providing books. I wanted to get involved in a bigger way that would really talk about the importance of literacy to families. Can you speak to like what the importance is of reading as a young age, as like an educator? I know the school has talked about at some board meetings, they're pushing like reading and literacy at young ages. Yeah. Can you speak yeah. to like why that's important, like some statistics maybe? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked. Through my work with Dolly Parton and through my work as an educator, I know that by the age of three years old, a child's brain is already 80% developed. So by the age of three, And you just think about what happens between birth and three to children and with children and what they're involved with. And very often it's just daily care. It's not any educational purposes. It might be daycare. It might be a stay-at-home mom, a grandparent. But it's daily care. It's feeding. It's growing. It's learning to do a whole bunch of things, you know, crawling, walking, talking, language. And with 80% of the brain developed by the age of three, it's so important that we do things with some intentionality about developing that brain and reading and talking and singing is such an important part of what develops language sitting together and reading a book on a lap that nurturing of a relationship and a bond that can happen during that time is something we want to help families know to intentionally create through the act of reading or singing or listening to and mimicking that child and how they learn language. And then just the importance of reading aloud to very young children by the age of five, you know, as a principal and as a teacher, how can my child be behind at kindergarten on day one? Well, how many words will a child know by the time they are five and entering kindergarten? If we never read to children, they'll know about 4,600 words, 4,600 words. If we read to them one to two times per week, 
it's 63,000 words. So just that one to three times a week, that number multiplies like 10 times, more than 10 times. And then if we read to them three to five times a week, it's 169,000 words. So again, it's exponentially. The more we read, the exponential more language our children will know when they go to school. And if we read to them daily, it's almost 300,000 words that they'll know compared to that child who's never read to at 4,600 words and 300,000 words. So there's going to be a difference in a kindergarten classroom of a child who knows 300,000 words and the child who knows 4,600 words. And then if we read to them, I mean, 300,000 sounds like a lot of words, and that's if we read to them daily. But if we read to them an average of five books a day, and this is not cover to cover, because we know that a child between birth and five is not gonna sit still cover to cover, but we have books in the home and we get them out and we look at them and we talk about them and we're reading them at bedtime and we're reading to them when they're taking a bath. You know, they're sitting in one place. We've got a captive audience. When they're in their high chair, we've got books. They're again, contained in a high chair, but they're part of what we do and part of what we have with our kids. But if we read to them an average of five books daily, it's over a million words, almost 1.5 million words that a child will know by the time they're five. So a child who knows 1.5 million words compared to that child who's never read to and knows 4,600 words. The brain is so different for those five-year-olds so different when they have those experiences. So we want to teach that to families, families who don't know that statistic and that research, we want to teach that to families. So I knew I needed an in with schools, I needed an in with preschools when I came back, I needed an in to access families, I needed a way to be where families were. I'd have an audience to listen and hear that information. And people like you, who's gonna put this on a podcast. (laughs) So what you're saying is if you read to your kid five times a day, they average, need, average. They don't even need to go to school or go to college. They just, they oh just don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're primed. You've they're primed, primed the well. You've primed. They're gonna be the bored brain. for the next eighteen years of their life. <laughs> well, it does say to teachers, "What are we gonna do?" Yeah, yeah. Would that be magical if teachers are listening or administrators are listening? <laughs> mm-hmm. If you had a classroom full of kindergartners who had been read to on a consistent basis, your instruction would look different. The kindergarten readiness in our county would look so different. And it would impact the readiness for them in, in all the grades. We would have to do something different. And I think teachers want to do something different, would love to have a classroom full of children like that. And families imagining the connection that they have because they've nurtured a relationship through literacy, through reading, and had those intimate moments of a child on your lap reading stories and connecting in that way, and a brain developed in that way. The emotional intelligence of, of our children in Clinton County would be different. There would be so many things that would be different. I like that it's not just about like reading and learning. It's like you said, it's the intimacy bond you build with your child. Mm -hmm. And also you said, obviously kids are not going to sit still to read all the time, but if they're like in a bathtub or in their high chair, Mm -hmm. like those are times when they can't move. They're like, they're also occupied on like washing or like eating. Or they might have the book there, you know, like, yeah, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And they might start in your lap and then go up and play Mm -hmm. with the blocks or whatever, and just keep reading because they're hearing that language. (laughs) It's what Elizabeth's doing with her teenage daughter. Now they're reading that book together that she talked about and they're talking about it together. Elizabeth knows that that will create a bond with her child, even at 13. Mm -hmm. And she's doing that with her child and she's done it all the way through. It just looks a little bit different at 13. Addie's not sitting on your lap. You're reading this book, but you're talking Mm -hmm. about it together. It shows that like you're interested in what your kids are interested mm-hmm. in, I guess, too. Yeah. And they're going to remember, even if they can't articulate it right now, mm-hmm. they're going to remember it later on. That you're my, exactly my right. My parent chose to like be interested in my life in this yeah. way. You're exactly right. Yep. And then you feel the connection mm-hmm. and you see how that's important to her and it perpetuates and it continues snowballing mm-hmm. into the next years of her life. So one thing that I do remember, though, from one of the farmer's markets that we had set up, at, there was a little girl that was there. And she wanted a chapter book and her mom was like, no, you can't read that. That's above, you know, where you can't. I said, well, she can take it for later. I said, or you guys can read a chapter a night and have it done, you know, in a couple weeks. And she goes, oh, I guess I could read to her. I said, yeah, you know, she would probably really love that. Mm-hmm. And the daughter's eyes just got really big. And the mom was like, 
we can do that. You know, so just even encouraging, mm-hmm. because Dolly has been around for just a few years, we have a gap. Filling in that gap between where we're really pushing for the younger, there's still going to be that age group in the middle who mm-hmm. needs that motivation as well and to be that person and to be encouraging to that little girl when I was like, you can, even if you can't do all of it right now, you absolutely can do that. And then to also be encouraging to the mom that was there, she had no interest in reading to her kid. She didn't even think about it. But I hope that they went home, you know, and just knowing that they had talked about it, you know, and kids are relentless. If you tell them something, they're, they're going to hold you to it. Yeah. So being that bridge is really important to me as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So present day, we now have 16 free little libraries set up in different businesses around the county. We have one in New Vienna, two in Blanchester, one in Port William, two in Sabina, and 10 in Wilmington. So you will see our little logo on every single one of them with a sign. People are more than welcome to take a book, take a couple books, share them with a friend, start an at-home library, And then when you're done with them, you can take them back or you can just keep them. And there's no stipulation on what needs to be done. Are people allowed to put books on the shelves or do they have to give them to you first? No, they can put them on. That's fine. Yeah. So we also have about five different locations currently who are interested in us putting a bookshelf in their business. And we are working on doing that. We had decided as a committee before we expanded any more that we needed to do a book drive. We just got out of a really big event that we had, that we held ourselves, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And we went through a lot of books. And so to be able to accommodate properly and not just have half empty bookshelves we wanted to do a book drive so currently we have a book drive we always take any age group but right now we are in really big need of the younger ages like maybe birth through elementary school those are the books that we need right now the board books the picture books But I say that sparingly because I don't want to discourage people from donating older books and chapter books for middle schoolers and anything beyond that as well. If people don't have books to donate, they can still donate monetarily. Absolutely. So they can visit us on Facebook at the Clinton County Literacy Foundation. We have a Venmo under the same name. And that goes straight to our nonprofit account that is set up at People's Bank. And if you donate, we will send you our tax ID and anything else that you need for tax purposes. Can they go into People's Bank and donate directly to People's Bank as well? Yes. Yep. You can go into any People's Bank location and donate directly into our account. I also want to say that, again, all of this is about breaking down barriers to access to books. And it's about promoting book ownership and promoting the creation of little libraries in their own homes. It's important for kids all ages and adults to value owning books and having a book to be able to go to, to pick out, to read. We know that looking back at those statistics that I said about littles, that we know that there's a greater likelihood that families will read to their children if they have access to book. That's Dolly's whole premise. We want books to be in the home so that families have books to read to them. And we want to continue that for all the ages and continue book access that there'd be a little library. I don't keep all books that I read, but there are those special books. And I have a bookshelf full of books that are on deck to read next. And I'm more likely to read next if I know what book. If I have a book that I can just go grab, I'm more likely to be into a book. So we want families to have books on their shelves that they can access. That makes sense because like in this day and age, streaming services, it's so easy just to turn on like whatever you want to watch. So mm-hmm. it, it should be just as easy for us to have that bookshelf right next exactly. to it. You know, we just pull a book off and read it whenever. Yeah, right. Even though we have free access to books at the library, it makes mm-hmm. sense to have it at your home just mm-hmm. for the ease of, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You said you had an event that you did recently? We did. Was so I was going to talk about that next. So we've talked about that we have done the Earth Day. We have done a lot of farmer's markets. We've set up in Blanchester, Sabina, everything else. So we wanted to do something ourselves. And we wanted something, you know, 
kind of big countywide for ourselves. And so we organized the Read Across Clinton County event. And when we first came up with this event, we wanted it to coincide with Read Across America week. Well, we know how busy families are and we know how busy everybody is. So we didn't want it to just be a week long. We made it two weeks long. We reached out to local businesses and they signed up to be a passport stop. And with them being a passport stop, the people came in and got a sticker at each one of the stops. They got a sticker. So not only are they going in to get a free book at these locations, and we had little book bins set up at each location, not only are they getting a free book, they're also going into local businesses. A lot of people hadn't heard of some of these businesses. These businesses are ready to do it again. They are so excited. We had such a great turnout. So we ended up having 860 passport stops made. So that means everybody to be entered into this drawing for prizes had to go to at least eight different passport stops. We had them all over the county, New Vienna, Sabina, Blanchester, Wilmington, And every place that they went, they got a book and then they got a sticker. After you get eight, you can turn it in or you can go to another eight places. 860 different times people went into different businesses in town. You had 860 stops, different businesses? No, we had 43 different stops. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. 43 different stops. Mm -hmm. And we had... Over two weeks. Over two weeks. Over those two weeks... When I went through and I counted all of the stickers that yeah. were submitted in, it was 860 stickers. Okay. Yeah. I was at Kava House one day and saw a bunch of kids and parents walk in, super excited, the little passports and yes. sticker books. That yes. Was really, it was really cool to see that. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. We were able at the end to hand out seven different prizes to adults and to kids because it wasn't just limited to the kids. And our grand prize was a new tablet that had a Kindle app on it. That was donated by Connection. And the Clinton County Convention and Visitors Bureau partnered with us. And then with them partnering, we were able to get really good prizes and local gift cards and local things to give away. That's pretty cool. You got people into local businesses and then also gave prizes from local businesses too. That's awesome. Yeah, we tried to make it a straight read across Clinton County event. I mean, we had a colorful passport. And my favorite picture that was submitted when they turned in the passport was this little boy. And he was holding it up. And he had, so there were 46 stops. He had 32 of them done. He went to 32 different places. And he said they just had the best time. And he had the biggest grin on his face. And that's how they submitted their passport to our email. And so I think forever, I was like, that's the biggest success for me. Elizabeth did a great job of creating this and tying it in at the time to Read Across America is a national reading promotion day. And it was our version of Read Across America was Read Across Clinton County. And it was really well done. Thank you. Another event that we had, we had a teacher book fair, an educator Mm -hmm. book fair. And last May, we received 10,000 pounds of books as a very large donation. It was my dream when we got this large donation of boxes of books, some multiple copies of books like Shakespeare or Judy Bloom's Blubber, and there'd be like multiple copies of them. But my dream was really to open up the boxes and set them out for teachers to choose from. And so we did that at spring break time. And we had a lot of homeschool families, a lot of Christian school families. And then from the county schools, we had teachers come, educators come. Wilmington College had pre-service teachers come and also some of their college professors came to just shop for free all the books from our 10,000 pound donation. So we've estimated that we've probably used about 2,000 pounds prior to that free book fair in our farmer's markets and then just supplying our bookshelves. We used about 2,000 pounds of books, but we estimate that we probably gave away 4,000 pounds of books during that recent spring break teacher educator book fair. There were a lot of middle-aged books and a lot of adult books as well. So we were able to really keep our shelves stocked during that time. There was very few of the little books that we need Mm -hmm. currently. We went through those. So we still have a lot of books. We still have a lot to offer, but always need more. Yeah. Yeah. 
you guys said before the podcast that some of your passions recently are going to be trying to get a mobile book bus Mm -hmm. and also addressing the needs of adult literacy. Mm -hmm. Right. So adult literacy really came about as a shock to us. So we started doing these events. We were geared towards littles. That's in our mind. You hit them young, you know, and teach them to love books and the adventures of books. Well, what we quickly found out is that the Middle Ages wanted books as well. And so we adapted and grew into Middle Ages. And then we have been approached several times about adult literacy because there's not really a program currently. There has been in the past for adult literacy. I've had people come in and grab a book and be like, I can't read, but I like to look at the pictures or straight ask us who to go to help with. So we have partnered with the Resource Center in Wilmington. There are people who go there just need help to read so that they can fill an application. So we've been able to point them in the right direction of somebody at Southern State that is helping them. So to me, I would love for an end game to that to be regular programming that adults can come to or listen to to help that way as well. Yeah, right now, adult literacy programs are geared towards the GED and adults who want to pass the GED. And that's great. There's definitely a need for that. I think, though, that the need that we hear more about is just about the need to learn to read. So we're at the beginning stages of that, really, of trying to help figure out what that might look like in our county. As Elizabeth said, there have been tutoring programs before, like at the Wilmington Public Library, there have been tutoring programs. It no longer exists. And so we're just looking to see what that might look like in our community beyond Wilmington, but around the county, what the needs are and how to serve those needs. Some of it's, you know, the barrier of getting to a place. If we had tutoring in the library, there are people who would struggle to get to a local library to get their literacy needs met. So I think we need to continue the conversation. We need volunteers like Elizabeth and I can't do everything and that core group of people that we talked about who are on the board can't do everything. But people maybe listening today might be interested in helping with adult literacy. And, you know, I think we need to look at training people to be adult literacy teachers. What kind of person needs like adult literacy? Like, is it someone who is from a different country. What is the general causes of not being able to read as an adult? So the causes to me are unknown. I don't know. I didn't go through the education field, but from what I see, it is people who are in need. Either they didn't have the resources growing up to read. Maybe they didn't finish school. The gentleman who stopped by at our last farmer's market, he said that he is in town, he has a job, he is working, but he just is not a good reader and he can't read. And so he just took some comic books. He looked at those. It's all about where it starts. You just never know. I think every case that I personally have heard has been a different scenario. Mm-hmm. We've had homeless come up and take books absolutely go for it. I've had people stop in the news journal and get books that are walking by. Mm -hmm. So just having them available is great. But also if they express a want to learn how to read, then we are working towards finding what that want looks like. It is still very new to us. Yeah. I just kind of wonder what's the driving force of someone who's wanting to learn how to read, but if it's not a GED, like is it just leisure or just like self-respect? I think it's a, a self-respect. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of these people you can tell are trying to better themselves. But I think it's hidden. I think a lot of times it's hidden, the fact mm-hmm. that somebody can't read. So mm-hmm. I think the thing that would reveal someone's hidden identity of being a non-reader or someone who doesn't read well would be that there has to be a reason why I'm going to now learn how to read. It might be to just feel better and to be more successful. It might be to get a job. It might be to pass the GED. But it might also be in our work around littles to be able to read a story to my child. If I understand the importance of reading to my child and I realize that I'm not a reader, I have to admit that. And my child's going to find out because now we have books in the home 
and I don't know how to read to my child. And maybe that's a reason why they don't let books in their home. So we have to be able to break through that stigma of the shame of somebody who can't read, who wants to read to their child, but can't read. And maybe they were someone at school. I'm imagining that person, a poor reader and a poor student, and just never understood the phonemic awareness that somebody was trying to teach them. Because I know from being an educator in Clinton County that there are teachers who are trying really hard to teach non-readers how to read every day. And so it's not that this child was ignored and pushed under the rug and sat in the corner and was unnoticed. We notice the reading level of every child in our county and what they're doing and what their struggles are. And we work hard to meet their needs. But this might have been a child who just, it just didn't click for whatever. We can think of a number of reasons why it might not. But now they're ready because they see the importance. They might have the maturity that they didn't have when all these interventions were in place for them. And I'd love to be able to have a place where these adults could go and people that these adults could see that know how to help them. And it's going to take training. It's going to take training an army of adults to help those individuals. It's good to know just that it's not maybe just people training people who are homeless to read. It's, it's a variety of people. That it's, it's a variety. Oh, I think it's it a variety. Be, it is 100% I think it could be variety. homeless people. Yeah, yeah. It could be homeless mm-hmm. people. It could be the newcomer mm-hmm. to America to, mm-hmm. who comes to Clinton County. It could be a number of different people. This gentleman that I'm referring to again, I've seen him in the community working. Mm-hmm. I've seen him being a part of the community. There is no rhyme or reason. There, it's all different reasons. Yes. Yeah. So, and we would want to welcome all of them. Yep. And we would want to, you know, that somebody who says I'm not a good reader, well, there are ways to assess their level of reading and what they need and that person who is not a good reader would for sure need something different than the person whose English is not a first language or someone who doesn't understand phonemic awareness. So we're going to kind of wrap things up here. I know you guys mentioned before the podcast that you have some camps that you're going to be part of this summer. So right now, that's like an end game. We would like at some point in time to have like book camps and stuff like that. There's nothing on the books right now to do that. Right now, we are working on getting more books. We're having book drives. We plan on being at the farmer's market. Every Monday, we have a Read With Me Monday with Sarah Williams or a special guest. And she reads to the younger age group and on Facebook Live. And then on Wednesday at 7 p.m., Jamie Rowe reads a chapter book. And she'll read a couple chapters a night. And we're working on partnering with The Parks is trying to launch a summer movie series. And so we want to read a book that we can have like a party at the end that way that sounds really cool yeah our big thing is just making sure that we get to as many events as we can to set up and to be a part of the community and to offer the free resources that we have yeah a lot of the plans that we have for this summer right now are in wilmington but we really want to be countywide. so we really are looking to partner with the parks in blanchester community in new vienna sabina Port William, we just want to really be all over the county. We've talked some about the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, and when we look at our county map and we look at the shape of our county, if you can picture that in your head, and then we look at all of the families who are enrolled in the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, we have 70% of our county children currently enrolled in the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, 70%. And when you look at where all those homes are, they are all over the county. The whole county is dotted with Dolly Parton Imagination Library households. So we're really proud of that fact that the Dolly Parton Imagination Library is all over the county. And our books are all over the county, but we really want our activities to also be all around the county. So we are looking for invitations always from businesses, from communities, from parks, recreation, churches, to be at their places where families are so that we can share our books with them. And if anybody is interested, they can reach out to us on social media, either Instagram or Facebook, or they are more than welcome to email us at ccliteracyfoundation at gmail.com. Yeah. 
And we'll also be at Buffalo Wild Wings for a fundraiser event on May 6th from 4 to 9 p.m. Buffalo Wild Wings is also hosting a book drive, a book drive for us that for the month of May to support our summer reading. And currently we have a book drive going on with all of the people's banks in the county and Wilmington Savings Bank where you can take any books and drop them off there or the news journal. You guys have so much going on. So much. <laughs> and to be clear, the Dolly Parton Imagination Library is separate from the Clinton County Literacy Foundation. Mm -hmm. You can find the Dolly Parton Imagination Library also on social media, Clinton County Dolly Parton Imagination Library. And there's information there on how to enroll in the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. We're looking for those other 30% of our kiddos not yet enrolled to get 100% enrollment in the county. Okay, so before we leave, what's one piece of wisdom that you've learned throughout your life that you'd like to share with others? Tomorrow's a new day. Make today the best that you can, and if it's not good, make tomorrow a new one. Yep. And I would say do what you can in your small corner of the world, something positive for the universe. And when I was a principal, I used to tell kids, what you put out comes back to you. It's like a boomerang. So I want good things to come to you, so you have to be putting out good things so what can you do in your small corner of the world to bring out positive energy so positive things will happen to you? Yeah. I think some people want to cause change by like being disruptive and angry, but then like what does that leave us? Like there's a community of people who are angry and yeah. disruptive. So it's like what you put out there is gonna be come more back forgiving to and graceful mm -hmm. and like yeah. Mm -hmm. I try to be positive as about as much as I can. I believe in community over competition. Mm -hmm. I'm a big component of that. I work at the news journal and I'm sitting here supporting you guys. I, I do respect I, you for that. Yes, thank lot. you. I, <laughs> I do have a um, lot of respect for that. I truly believe in mm -hmm. community over competition. For sure. And I hope that I show that in my actions. Actions do speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And there's so many great things that can happen as long as you put your mind to it and you just work for it. All of this is a lot of work. And this isn't all we do. I mean, I sit on three other boards and have a full-time job and three kids at home. Yeah. But it's all in how you make each day count. There's a lot of people who like to gripe about things, but taking responsibility, I think, is big, too. It's everyone's responsibility for like, their yeah. own organizations mm -hmm. and stuff, so. It's yeah. easier for people to complain than to make yeah. a change. Yeah. yeah. I don't get into all of that because I feel like I can help make things better by trying to get people to read earlier. Thank you guys for what you do for our community. Yeah. Thanks for the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for our podcast today, folks. Hope you enjoyed our interview with Karen Long and Elizabeth Hubert with the Clinton County Literacy Foundation. If you have more questions or ideas for them, feel free to reach out directly. If they'll talk to us two dorks, they'll talk to anyone. <laughs> After all, we are a community of empowered individuals. So, Tiara, if people want to get in touch with Real Change Wilmington, how would they do that? You can submit a contact form on our website, realchangewilmington.com, or you can follow us on social medias, once again, Real Change Wilmington, and shoot us a message. Yep, very cool. With that, I'm your host, Dustin Pierce. And I'm your co-host, Tiara Harris. Keep it real, Wilmington.